We're glad to have you with us. Welcome to Business Incorporated. I am BC at Debayo. Coming up on today's show, AFDB says East Africa remains Africa's fastest growing region despite COVID-19 disruption. Kenya's credit market set to slow down as effects of COVID-19 pandemic takes hold. Plus, ESCOM extends nationwide power cuts for a fourth straight day. Let's begin the program right away with intraday market numbers, which were mostly negative in Africa, except in South Africa, where the GSC index jumped 1.09%. Here in Nigeria, the main index began the week in the red zone by 0.27% as at midday. Elsewhere in the region, the EGX30 in Egypt lost 0.25%, while Kenya closed negative on Friday. Most major golf markets were subdued at intraday today, mostly hurt by losses in financial shares, while property shares weighed on Dubai's index. Dubai's main index lost the most by 0.87%, with Emma properties falling 1.1%, and Sharia compliant a 0.7% fall in Qatar Islamic Bank. Only Saudi Arabia's index rose marginally by 0.02%. And European stocks traded higher despite the backdrop of surging coronavirus cases in some parts of the world. And as investors approach earnings season, well, let's talk to Orange Bat at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange for more from the European scene. But just before we get to Orange, let's cross over to Asia where stocks jumped today. And that came as investors shrugged off concerns over the rising number of coronavirus cases stateside. And mainland Chinese stocks were among the the biggest gainers regionally on the day as the Shenzhen component soared 3.49%, while the Shanghai composite was up 1.77% to around 3,443.29. Elsewhere, the Nikkei 225 in Japan rose 2.22% as shares of conglomerate SoftBank Group and robot maker uh, Fanuc soared 4.23% and 3.24% on the Topics Index advanced 2.46%, finishing at 1,573.02. Hong Kong's Hansang Index rose 0.57% as at its final hour of trading, while Australia's S&P ASX 200 added 0.98%, finishing at 5,977.5. Stock futures rose in early morning trade today as investors looked past a record spike in coronavirus cases in Florida. Futures on the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 185 points, pointing to a more than 200-point gain at Monday's open, while the S&P 500 futures and the Nasdaq 100 futures also pointed to a positive Monday start for the two indexes. The Dow and the S&P 500 are coming off two consecutive weeks of gains, while the resilience in tech shares pushed the Nasdaq to a new record after three straight positive weeks. Let's take a quick trip now to London, where Juliana Olayinka is standing by to tell us more about what's driving the markets this afternoon. Good afternoon, Juliana. A research firm or research from the Institute of Directors shows that only one in four companies are prepared for Britain's full departure from the European Union in five months due to lack of clarity on rules. Does this truly reflect the true position of many companies in the UK regarding Brexit? Good afternoon, Bissy. It absolutely does. The IOD, the Institute of Directors, they've got about 30,000 members and about 78% of FTSE 100 companies have somebody within their senior management as a member of the IOD. This poll that they conducted um, was last month and uh, they asked about 1,000 um, senior directors their position on Brexit and an overwhelming majority of them do feel unprepared. Britain officially left um, the EU EU on the 31st of January, but due to the transitional period, nothing much has changed. But of course, there will be changes at the end of the year, and that was made abundantly clear last month when uh, Downing Street said they will not be extending the transition period beyond December the 31st, 2020. Uh, so businesses have to get ready, and they don't feel as if they are ready. There has been a new initiative launched by the government, which has been chaired by Cabinet Minister Michael Gove. He's a very 
senior cabinet minister in charge of Brexit within Britain. And uh, that new um, change is called Get the, the UK's new start, let's get going. And that's aimed at British citizens who want to travel um, to the EU in January. That's also aimed at businesses, businesses that import and export and so and so forth. Um, so there is a new uh, campaign that's going out on radio, TV and billboards across Britain. So people will be seeing it. It's also interesting and worth noting that the IOD, when they spoke to the senior managements um, at a FTSE 100 level, they said that they've been more focused on COVID-19, uh, which is why a lot of individuals and businesses have kind of put Brexit under the rug. But uh, as it has been doing for the past four years, it's surely going to be coming up again because, of course, the deadline is ever near. All right. Now, the chief executive of BT, Philip Johnson, is warning of outages and uh, security risk if the UK ditches Huawei, saying it will be impossible to strip the global ICT provider out of the UK telecoms within 10 years. Of course, we know that his comments follow suggestions that a decision is due to be made public by the Culture Secretary on Tuesday over the future of Huawei in the UK. What else do we need to know about this whole issue? Well, it's a major, it's a major, major issue. It's a major story, not just affecting Britain, of course, but across uh, the world. And we are going to be expecting an announcement from the Prime Minister, actually, Boris Johnson, tomorrow after he conducts a national security briefing. And what we're expecting is that there will be a massive U-turn and that the Prime Minister will say that he no longer will be permitting Huawei uh, to have um, any sort of role in building Britain's 5G network. It was only January that the Prime Minister, after pretty, um, you know, increasing pressure from um, the US President Donald Trump, as well as the other Five Eyes Network, which includes Canada, New Zealand, Australia and America. None of them are happy uh, with Britain's initial decision to allow Huawei to build about 34 percent of the component of the infrastructure. Uh, but since then, of course, COVID-19 has happened. We've got those new national security laws in Hong Kong, which Britain feel particularly breathed um, over. And and uh, the relationship between China and Britain is uh, very, very strained. Now, we do already know uh, that um, Huawei um, have told Britain that there will be severe consequences if indeed they do decide to pull um, the relationship. And we did hear, as you said, uh, from BT's chief exec, he was giving an interview uh, with BBC Radio 4, and he said uh, that the Huawei has been in the telecoms infrastructure for about two decades and is a big supplier to BT and any other UK telecom industry. He said it's all about timing and balance um, and that if Huawei was to be pulled for the UK, it would take at least 10 years uh, for them to pull each component out. So Philip obviously stressing just um, how crucial their role has been and how intricate it will be to try and remove them. But over the weekend, we also heard from MI6 former chief Sir Richard uh, Dearblue, who said that um, Huawei is a capability in the bank for China if indeed they need to use it. So we've had the head of MI6 stressing uh, that, you know, um, Huawei is an intimate part of China's uh, national security. And if indeed Britain did go ahead and it allowed them to build 5G, then it would be a security risk, which, of course, is what Donald Trump has been saying to Prime Minister Boris Johnson all along. So are we getting any reactions from the markets now? Tell us how the numbers are shaping up at intraday. Well, it's been a pretty positive day uh, for the FTSE, even though, of course, coronavirus is never far behind the trader's mind. And at intraday, the all share is up 0.86%. The FTSE 100 is up 0.86%. And the FTSE 250 is up by 0.84%. It's worth mentioning that uh, on the FTSE 250, G4S, the security service provider, um, their shares rose 12% um, at early trading because they've re, -re announced their um, profit guidelines. Um, in currencies, the pound is down on the US dollar by 0.18%, down on the euro by 0.41% and down on the Japanese yen by 0.03%. I think I mentioned it earlier to Chimmy uh, Bissy, but we've got a big week coming up um, in UK data. We've got GDP figures for May uh, coming out tomorrow, which is going to be very, very interesting considering all the pretty dire reports we've had from the OECD and other...
um, data analytics, looking at Britain's economy. We've also got mm. inflation figures and unemployment figures. So it's going to be an interesting uh, week for the government. Absolutely, Juliana, and we we'll look forward to you bringing us the details of those later. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. All right, let's turn now to Europe, where RH Bats is ready for us at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange to tell us what's driving today's markets. Good afternoon, RH. So the markets in Europe are starting off the week in a surprisingly upbeat mode. Risks are being ignored. Why is that? Well, um, they're ignoring the risks. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the markets are looking uh, eagerly forward to uh, quarterly results that are rolling in. Already last week, uh, SAP, the German software maker, the most expensive share here in the European market, surprised investors uh, with surprisingly good results. And now people are hoping that the same will be true of uh, American companies, which we'll start reporting this week. Uh, tomorrow, we have three big banks, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. J.P. Morgan, arguably the world's most uh, profitable bank. And uh, people are looking for pleasant surprises. Now, they know that these banks have challenges. They know that other companies have challenges, uh, but uh, especially in the corona times. Uh, but they're hoping that um, uh, the results that they see will be better than the guidance uh, that they received so far. And I think... The hope that there is something more, that something is improving, is what's driving the markets here. Of course, along with all that fiscal and central bank stimulus that we're seeing and hopes of uh, progress on the virus. But German car maker Daimler says it will need to cut more jobs than the 15,000 which was previously announced. Now, the head of human resources says that the company needs to increase cost cutting as uh, demand for cars slumps due to the pandemic. But is it really just the pandemic that is accelerating the cost cutting measures? It's not just a pandemic. I think the problem that Daimler has uh, became at last or, or lastly clear at uh, the last week's uh, annual general meeting, where there was lots of criticism of Dita Zetsche, the CEO, uh, the previous CEO, now it's uh, his, his successor, Ola Kalenius. And there's a slew of models, um, many of which don't seem to be really uh, attracting customers. Uh, small numbers uh, being produced, uh, not profitable. And Daimler has to clean this up as well. And Ola Kalenius has promised that. Uh, he says that he's going to look at the model mix uh, and that Daimler is going to improve uh, in that vein. Also, the company is facing billions of investments into electric mobility and autonomous driving. And uh, the company just needs to cut costs wherever it can, the new CEO says. And it looks like he's quite decided on doing that. All right, just before I let you go, Arish, because uh, it doesn't look like a very good day for the connection. But the EU chieftains will meet for a <laughs> summit at the end of the week. And foremost on the agenda is a substantial financial package to help the EU get back on track and uh, overcome the economic devastation of the coronavirus. How important is this for the sentiments in the markets? I think it's uh, very important, especially for Europe, but I think not only for Europe. Uh, the numbers are huge. 750 billion uh, is uh, the number that's uh, been put into the window. 500 billion euros in, in grants to member states and 250 billion in loans. But it's, it's not a done deal yet. And uh, that's why traders are looking so carefully at it. Uh, today, Angela Merkel with a visit by the Italian PM. Tomorrow, the Spanish PM. Uh, comes to visit uh, in order to have pre-summit talks, very important ones. It's controversial, not least, because there are those frugal four um, countries which uh, think doing too much or doing such a lot of money uh, without uh, preconditions is unwise. Uh, so people are looking forward to this summit, wanting to know how much is Europe willing to commit, how cohesive is Europe, basically what kind of an economic political and cultural future does it have? Thank you, RH Ho, for a better connection tomorrow. Do enjoy the rest of your day. When we return in just a moment, we'll talk about how the death of Cote d'Ivoire's Prime Minister will impact the country's economy. Do you stay with us? Welcome back. 
The death of Côte d'Ivoire's Prime Minister Amadou Koulibaly last week has significantly altered the political scene ahead of the elections this year, creating more uncertainty for businesses. The West African country is already reeling from lost jobs and lost businesses, with many people struggling to keep food on the table and often falling back into extreme poverty they had left behind due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining me now to talk about what this will mean for the economy, given President Watara's positive management of the economy in recent years, is Matthew Kindiger, a senior analyst, Sub-Saharan Africa Research at Docker Frontier in London. Good afternoon, Matt. Thanks for joining us on the program. Well, let's begin this conversation with you telling us why the timing of Koulibaly's death is so significant and how it will affect the political landscape ahead of the October presidential elections. Yes, certainly. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Um, Mr. Koulibaly's death is very significant, especially in terms of the timing. Uh, and this is because his death will compound some of the recent political developments in the country and amplify political tensions in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, the, there was a huge amount of uncertainty about whether Mr. Ouattara, the current president, would run for re-election. Uh, and when he decided in March not to run for re-election re and nominate Mr. Koulibaly as his successor, this was viewed positively. Uh, but with Mr. Koulibaly's death, uh, there is now no clear successor to Mr. Ouattara, and this compounds a couple of other things that have really upset the political landscape in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, and this includes the acquittal of Mr. Uh, Agbo, who was the former president uh, of Cote d'Ivoire and a very divisive figure, um, uh, and also the conviction in absentia of Mr. Ouattara's former ally and presidential can, um, candidate, uh, Guillaume Soro, of embezzlement. So both these factors um, are very significant, or all three of these factors are very significant political developments, and they do contribute to, to a polarization of the political landscape this year. And it makes the outcome of the election in October much more difficult to predict. Now, if you look at the commercial landscape now in Côte d'Ivoire, it has fared relatively well despite the COVID-19 pandemic. But as the election nears now, to what extent will political volatility present risks for businesses? Yes, that's right. So um, although uh, Côte d'Ivoire has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, like all countries, Comparatively, uh, the you know businesses have got off relatively well in Cote d'Ivoire, and the economy is doing relatively well, especially in contrast to a country like South Africa. Um, however, uh, because Cote d'Ivoire has a very fraught and difficult history with elections, uh, with periods of violence quite common in and around elections, you know we will recall that after the 2010 election, there was a, a protracted period of, of civil unrest. Um, th this means that the, the increasing polariz polarization of the political landscape that is taking place in Cote d'Ivoire at the moment uh, creates a much greater risk of disruption to commercial activity um, caused by political violence in, in the coming months. Um, and so this means that companies can expect some short-term disruption uh, to their operations resulting from protests that turn violent, especially as we get closer to the vote in October. Um, another point worth mentioning is that uh, the risk of a return to a much broader civil conflict after the election cannot be ruled out. Although here at Dhaka Frontier, we do not expect another civil war uh, to happen, like we saw in 2010, uh, 2011, um, nonetheless, uh, the risk of, uh, of a protracted period of violence after the election certainly has increased. Uh, well, the country's economy has actually performed well under President Alassane Ouattara. What would a potential change in administration after the election mean for the country's economic outlook? Yeah, so it's a great question. So um, here at the frontier, uh, our base case has always been that we expect the uh, Ivorian economy to rebound strongly in 2021 after the worst effects of the COVID-19 pandemic part and after the election is over. And this is because uh, Cote d'Ivoire has a very healthy consumer base, very resilient uh, of exports and fairly high levels of investment into the economy. So any uh, change in administration, given the very positive um, uh, sort of economic performance that the economy has enjoyed, will create uncertainty um, in this economy. 
But in Cote d'Ivoire, this uncertainty uh, would be much uh, accentuated, uh, and, the, and the risk to the outlook is much greater as a result of the change in administration. And this is because uh, the current president, Mr. Ouattara, has had a, he has really stood out among African leaders for his very close relationship with uh, developed economies. Um, he's uh, had a very good relationship with multilateral institutions. Uh, he was a former IMF official himself. And he's also introduced a number of, of pro-business reforms uh, over the last performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this certainly means that if there is to be a change in administration over the next six months or so, um, this All right. really does call into question All right, whether Matt. Uh, a new government will uh, follow the same policies. Thank you, Matt. Senior Analyst at Sub-Saharan Africa Research at Docker Frontier in London. Thanks for speaking with us on the program. All right. The African Development Bank says East Africa remains the continent's fastest growing region despite COVID-19 disruptions. According to the bank's East Africa Regional Economic Outlook 2020, economic disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed East Africa's growth projection for 2020 down to 1.2 percent, but forecast a rebound of 3.7 in 2021. In the worst-case scenario in which the pandemic persists until the end of 2020, the AFDB projects a growth of 0.2 percent, and that's still above Africa's predicted average of minus 1.7 percent and minus 3.4 percent under the two scenarios. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the region's economic growth was projected at more than 5 percent, well above the continent's average of 3.3 percent and global average of 2.9 percent. However, COVID-19 induced shocks and a locust invasion have contributed to job losses, increased humanitarian needs and will aggravate poverty and income inequality. Kenya's credit markets will come under severe pressure as the COVID-19 pandemic impacts the country's economy, with gross domestic products expected to slow to between 4.5% and 5.5%, down from an earlier forecast of 5.9%. A study conducted by the American Consumer Credit Reporting Agency, TransUnion, reveals that individuals and businesses are failing to meet their credit obligations, which could lead to an increase in non-performing loans. The survey comes after the Central Bank of Kenya in June revealed that the ratio of non-performing loans stood at 13.1%, the highest since August 2007, when it stood at 14.41%. This showed that banks were losing an average of 131 shillings for every 1,000 shillings loaned in a period when lending rates have fallen to 15-year lows at 12.09%. And in South Africa, state-owned power utility ESCOM has defaulted on its prediction that there will be only three days of electricity rationing during the nation's winter season. ESCOM Holdings implemented the nationwide rotational power cuts for a full straight day today to replenish emergency generation reserves needed during the week. But ESCOM cut its forecast for the power outages from 31 days to three during the winter season that runs from June to August after pandemic lockdown measures lowered demand and allowed more repairs. And that's where we end today's program. Thank you for watching. I am BC Adebayo.